glad to see you all here today. I was just waiting for you to. <laughs> um, so let's uh, just begin. I think we are uh, in time for this. I'll be nearby because I don't, we don't have a, like a. Okay, sounds good. Uh, well, my name is uh, Marcelo. I work for this awesome project uh, called uh, Aurora. And here today, I will be explaining you how uh, we managed to fit a whole EVM ecosystem inside a near smart contract, uh, how uh, this actually works uh, internally, how, why we decided to, you, to use ETH as the base token uh, in Aurora, and uh, well, uh, why, why, why near, right? Like, uh, near is, in essence, like the new uh, ETH 2.0, in the sense, like, it brings a uh, the scalability and most of the promises that ETH 2.0 were uh, making, but it's uh, already here, which makes it uh, quite easy to fit uh, Aurora uh, inside, uh, uh, inside near ecosystem. I'll also be uh, talking a little bit about the uh, Rainbow Bridge. Uh, this is a bridge between near and Ethereum, a trustless bridge, uh, very intuitive to use. Uh, I'll keep this talk uh, uh, to like high level, I will go deep at some points, but I'll try to keep it high. But if you have like any deep questions, uh, we can uh, uh, discuss them in the end. I will be hanging around, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions uh, for any of you that uh, might be interested. Okay, so let's uh, get started now. This is how we are going to go. First, uh, a little bit about near then Aurora, and then the Rainbow Bridge. Just uh, extra about myself, I was working uh, for a long time on NIR, like a few years. Then uh, uh, when Aurora started, I was uh, working in Aurora, also as a software engineer, and helping the development of the bridge. So I'm somehow familiar with uh, all three parts, though they are quite big. Uh, there's, of course, uh, a lot to it. But yeah, please uh, pick me on any technical questions uh, you may have about any of them. So. Probably in this event you have heard a lot about uh, NIR itself. Uh, I will not spend too much time here, just uh, emphasize what have been told all the time, like NIR is a layer one. Uh, it uses proof, uh, proof of stake as consensus uh, mechanism. Uh, and it's uh, scalable through sharding and try to uh, be as user friendly as possible. That has been the main focus from the, from the very beginning, like try to onboard developers and to onboard uh, users uh, uh, as easy as possible, all right? So we always say this, uh, ETH 2.0, it's, uh, it's near. Uh, and in a sense, like the, when we were discussing about ETH 2.0, I think we are no longer discussing uh, about this, like ETH 2.0, uh, like they took uh, another path. But the main, uh, uh, what they were trying to do and what we were trying to do it's actually scaling through charting, charting computation, charting state, and bring like a massive amount of uh, computation, like secure and trustless computation, to a layer one, right? This is not how it is working right now on Ethereum. Uh, in Ethereum, it's working through uh, rollups uh, mainly, and that's what they are being optimizing. But near uh, keeps to its promise about uh, sharding. While it's not completely sharded already, uh, it's in a, a first stage which will enable charting uh, along the road, uh, probably during this, this uh, next year, right? So then what brings us to the uh, point of, uh, of Aurora? Near uh, runtime uh, has a synchronous runtime and uses backend. What does it, and uses WASM as backend. What does that mean? Like on uh, Ethereum we have a, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the Ethereum virtual machine, where we usually call it uh, EVM. Well, it was uh, created, like it, it worked as it was intended to, to work, but it doesn't allow to uh, squeeze as much performance as possible uh, in today's uh, architecture as, for example, WASM was designed to. Like EVM was designed uh, through the main idea of being simple and being able to be executed through a lot of systems. But uh, Wasm would allow us, like Wasm was not designed for blockchains explicitly, was uh, decided mostly to be able to run in every uh, operating system in any architecture, mostly for browsers, I would say. Um, blockchains have adopted these things. There is a lot of tooling and there is a, 
a way to run uh, really fast uh, applications using uh, like applications compiled to WASM. One of the things about having a sharded blockchains means that developers need to, to be aware in some sense about the sharding ecosystem. Um, this, is, uh, this is exposed to the developers through the asynchronous environment and this is per se, I would say, like good and bad thing in some sense, like it's good because it allows us to scale our uh, application. It's bad because reasoning about asynchronous application, it's tricky, like, right? Like you usually are really happy when you know about a new like uh, microprocessor that it's like 10x faster, but right now processors are not getting faster, I would say, but they, they're getting cheaper by having uh, more processors in the, in, in the same amount of, uh, in the same price, right? But to exploit that, you need to, to have your application to be, uh, run, uh, to, to be asynchronous, to exploit uh, the multiple processor. This is the same uh, with a sharded blockchain, right? Like a single uh, near shard will have a limit to which it will be able to scale and which will be able to squeeze uh, more performance out of it. But in general, the long-term plan is to scale through sharding. And applications should be uh, aware of this and in some sense they need to be aware of uh, the asynchronous environment and they need to use it uh, to scale with it. But what's the problem? Like current developers are not really, uh, like current blockchain developers are not extremely familiar uh, with uh, WASM or, or languages that compile to WASM and they are definitely not familiar either with uh, asynchronous uh, runtimes. They are familiar with uh, good old Ethereum which uh, gives us like an EVM uh, virtual machine uh, and a synchronous environment. And that's what uh, Aurora was here uh, to solve. Like the main issue we wanted to solve even before Aurora existed as a, as a project is that we want to be able to allow uh, Ethereum developers and Ethereum users uh, as a second uh, thing to be able to develop on top of Nier with, with uh, whatever tools uh, exist today uh, in the ecosystem, right? Uh, so the main point was to bring uh, EVM uh, to Nier, uh, making this possible, like we went through several iterations, but the main goal was we want to be 100% compatible with what works today uh, with, uh, with whatever code that works on, uh, on Ethereum, we want it to be 100% compatible uh, near, and most importantly, we want to be uh, synchronous, right? So every uh, composability between contracts should be executed synchronous, okay? So that's uh, why uh, Aurora is here. Ultimately, the decision was the following, like the, the most promising approach was the following. We make this uh, project that we call Aurora, which is basically a smart contract uh, on top of near protocol, which implements, which implements an EVM. What does that mean? We have uh, this, uh, uh, this contract, which is an interpreter, an EVM interpreter, that whatever EVM code uh, you execute on top of it, it will be uh, interpreted. The interpreter itself is a WASM code. It was written uh, in Rust and compiled to WASM and deployed to Nier. And within these smart contracts, all the, all the magic happens, right? That's uh, quite deep. I will be going, uh, 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 I will explain how users actually uh, interact with it. But the main point is that we, won't, uh, we want to have like 100% uh, compatibility. This project will, will, have, uh, uh, will allow you to execute whatever uh, you can uh, execute on Ethereum today. One of the nice properties of this design is that Aurora itself I don't like it to call it like a layer two, though it pretty much uh, could be uh, uh, seen as a layer two. But it, does, it doesn't have any sort of uh, validator, for example, or you don't need to execute uh, directly any sort of uh, consensus on top of the execution as you would do on uh, any layer one. And the, uh, and the main reason for this is that this is just a smart contract running on top of a, a existing blockchain, which is, uh, which is near blockchain. So near already has its validator, near already has uh, its uh, security model, and we just inherit all these properties. And whatever uh, scaling opportunities and performance gains that near uh, uh, gets, uh, Aurora uh, 
directly uh, get uh, the same boost, right? So, what is Aurora exactly? Let me go through a few of these uh, uh, few of these points. But well, I have already uh, mentioned some of it, like uh, this contract. The contract in itself has a very simple interface. It's a quite low level but simple interface that will allow you to users to get the same way as you would do in Ethereum. You get your transaction, you will sign your transaction and you will submit it to Aurora and the contract itself will uh, understand this transaction and will execute it uh, on top of this smart contract. This smart contract on itself has its own state as every smart contract does on Ethereum, on Near, and the, the state of Aurora smart contract is the state of the whole ecosystem. It means that uh, it stores uh, every, uh, every value relevant to each of the smart contracts that lives uh, uh, inside of Aurora. So you don't need to leave the system uh, at any point, right? You will get the synchronous environment because uh, even though near is asynchronous, it's asynchronous when you try to uh, compose two different smart contracts, like uh, from two different accounts when you try to compose stuff between uh, smart contracts on the air. But in, inside Aurora, there, there is like a living ecosystem. There is like a lot of smart contracts that lives inside of Aurora smart contracts. It's like a little bit like Inception. And uh, whatever it's executed inside of Aurora can be seen as a single near, uh, near transactions, like no cross contract call is made. There are just uh, internal uh, executions so we can revert everything if required, like you would do uh, exactly the same uh, on, uh, on Ethereum, right? So we mentioned Sputnik VM. This is currently the virtual machine we're using. This is a virtual machine for uh, Ethereum uh, virtual machine. We have expanded it to our needs and we actually are thinking about uh, moving away from Sputnik VM, but this is like long-term uh, plan and have uh, something uh, custom that will allow us uh, as better performance as possible, like there is a huge difference between interpreting uh, by code and actually by code compiled directly for the underlying architecture, which is, um, uh, which is WASM. You can see here before the next points, uh, just a showcase for those who have interacted a little bit uh, with Nier already. Uh, this is the Aurora smart contract, you can check it at this uh, address, you won't be seeing anything uh, great there, but this is just showcasing that it's basically a smart contract and you can see some information. Some interesting piece of information is that it's storage, it has in its storage two gigabytes, I think, well, I think not. This is by far one of the largest uh, smart contracts uh, on, uh, on near protocol and well, the resolution is uh, quite uh, low here, but there have been roughly 41 million transactions uh, so far since uh, uh, since its deployment. This is the number of transactions that have been executed on top of this uh, contract. This is just basic information shown on the near uh, on the near explorer. And well, on the right, this is like, I want to showcase the source code, which is a Rust uh, source code. Going back a little bit, uh, we have the RPC, and here I would say it's the one of the most important points uh, that we are trying to have as the Aurora team is that we want to hide all this complexity from users and from developers and we want to uh, give uh, the exact same experience. Like it's not only about being 100% compatible within the uh, virtual machine but within the whole ecosystem with all the, with all the tools, uh, with everything that uh, works already for Ethereum. And that's uh, one of the uh, most important components that exist today, it's uh, Aurora RPC, which basically works as a layer uh, between the near smart contracts and developers or users. So the Aurora RPC will expose exactly the same interface as Ethereum RPC, like Geth or Infura or SQL uh, or Alchemy or whatever um, uh, you might use. Today Aurora RPC will expose the same interface and will communicate uh, directly to the smart contract to fetch whatever relevant information um, you are asking. We will get a little bit more into the RPC uh, uh, next. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, what I'm telling you. This, uh, having this tool will allow us seamlessly to integrate any sort of, uh, of tool that exists on Ethereum. For example, here we mentioned a few tools, but recently, like a week ago or so, I was learning 
uh, and trying this new tool like Foundry. Uh, it it's actually looks, uh, looks extremely good. Uh, it's uh, brand new. Uh, definitely developers of Foundry didn't know anything about uh, Aurora in itself, but the tool works uh, on Aurora as well, as long as you configure your endpoint as uh, Aurora PC. But you need to configure your endpoint uh, by yourself, and the tool works as well uh, in Aurora. And one uh, really nice feature, I would say, uh, of Aurora is that the base token is ETH. Uh, what does that mean and how, how is that possible? Basically, users uh, will pay the transaction uh, gas. They will, pay it, uh, they will pay it in ETH, as in real ETH. They need to bring the ETH, uh, either bring it from Ethereum to NIR to Aurora, like Aurora lives on NIR, so it's like bringing it to NIR and then inside of Aurora. You can do that through Rainbow Bridge application, or you can basically buy uh, ETH inside uh, whatever DEX exist, uh, exists on Aurora today. Is this a normal sound? Oh, probably not, not relevant here. Um, so, one important thing is the following. Aurora, uh, like, this is, uh, these are near transactions. So near transactions uh, require near gas to be executed, and near gas is paid with near. No, uh, uh, no with ETH. But we'll see how we managed to make this possible. Uh, the main reason we wanted to make this possible is that we wanted that you could copy past whatever code you have on Ethereum, you could copy past and deploy it uh, on, uh, on Aurora itself. The main point is not to copy past the code, but the thing that you can develop uh, with a EVM agnostic uh, mentality, right? You're not developing for Aurora, you're developing for any EVM, and it will work uh, seamlessly in, a, in any of them, right? So this I show you for, and then a little bit about uh, ETH as a base token. First, let me guide you through the whole uh, life of uh, Aurora transaction, and then I'll, uh, I'll show how, and then it will be kind of clear how uh, ETH uh, as the base token um, is working. So, first of all, you will use uh, MetaMask or whatever wallet tool you have to, get, uh, to sign uh, a transaction. Let's say it's a transaction where you are sending like 20 dice from one address to the other. You need to, in to interact with a DAI uh, uh, smart contract. And this transaction, which is only an, an Ethereum transaction, it's signed by, with your uh, private key from your wallet, you send it to the RPC, right? only the transaction, sign a transaction. The RPC, this is the Aurora RPC, will wrap this transaction in a near transaction. Basically, your transaction is the input of a function inside, uh, inside Aurora smart contract. Used to, here, you will see this function, submit. Uh, it's a little bit weird because it's not this argument, but inside this function we actually get uh, the, the argument, and the argument is your signed transaction, and from this uh, payload, we, will, we, can get, uh, uh, we can get who is the sender, what's the target transaction, what's the code to be executed. So the Aurora PC basically will do the following. It will wrap the transaction as a near transaction with uh, the signed transaction as the payload. And it will send it to a near node. We uh, are running on our own uh, near nodes, so we send it to our own uh, instance. But basically, anyone can run an Aurora RPC, and anyone can send these transactions. Here, something interesting happens. It's our RPC who is uh, signing the near transaction and who is paying uh, for the near gas, right? So the transaction is executed on behalf of the Aurora RPC. We actually call this account like relay.aurora. You will see that it has uh, millions of uh, of uh, transactions already on behalf uh, of this account. And then this account hits, uh, well, near RPC. In this case, it's uh, one of our nodes. And uh, the transaction is automatically, here, uh, it's basically like the transaction is executed in the context of the Aurora uh, smart contract. Aurora smart contract just decode this transaction, executed, and compute how much gas it would take if it were in uh, EVM terms, right? So they are not quite compatible. Uh, it would be ideally there should be like some sort of linear relationship. 
In practice, it's not uh, completely linear, but doesn't really uh, matter that much. Uh, it's anyway uh, on near ecosystem transactions are extremely, uh, extremely cheap on the order of uh, cents. So uh, the transaction is executed, the gas is computed, and from this gas and the gas price established by the by the user, uh, the ETH uh, balance is deducted from the signer transaction, and uh, it's uh, sent to the relayer itself. So basically, you send a transaction to the relayer. And the relayer will pay for near gas and will get in return all the uh, all the ETH uh, that you pay for the transaction. We were running for a really long time, for several months. Uh, we were running the our relayer with a zero uh, gas price for ETH. And the main reason for this is that actually near transactions are extremely cheap, and it was a, a very nice interface for new users that doesn't have any ETH, not only from users on Ethereum that doesn't have ETH on Aurora, but for new users to the whole uh, blockchain ecosystem. In practice, um, it was not uh, sustainable, but not in the sense you might think. It was not a, a problem about um, subsidizing the transaction, but it was about the spam, what uh, uh, made us to, uh, to put a, a, a gas fee. It's still subsidized today, but the gas fee is non-zero. It's like uh, 0.03 uh, way, uh, something like that. But in general, there is um, no restriction for anyone to run their own RPC with a zero gas fee. I mean zero gas fee quoted because you actually, like whoever runs the relayer needs to pay the near gas fees. Uh, like that cannot be uh, avoided anyway. When the transactions is executed, uh, you get uh, automatically the result, the RPC will get uh, this value, actually it's like going backwards here, and uh, this uh, result is sent uh, to your wallet, to your tool, to anything, and you, and you get, like from the point of view of the user, it only interacted with the RPC the same way it would have uh, interacted uh, with uh, any uh, Ethereum RPC. Regarding gas price, right now we uh, introduced uh, this new concept of uh, Aurora Plus. Uh, you will be able to see it, but the main point is that we want to make onboarding to the blockchain ecosystem as easy uh, as possible, and we would love to actually pay the gas fees uh, for our users. So one of the main goals is to try uh, to provide this interface by uh, trying to authenticate real, uh, to authenticate real uh, users in the ecosystem. So uh, that's uh, one of our uh, main milestones is to actually try to onboard as many users as possible without uh, exposing to, uh, to all the complexity uh, of the blockchain. Notice here that one important point, it's not only that uh, the RPC will hide uh, the Aurora complexity, it will hide all the near complexity. So it's uh, possible that for a lot of users, they don't even need to know that they are working with a near blockchain. It maybe might, might make some sense in the future as they get to do uh, more complicated tasks, but you need, you'll need to uh, immediately expose them to this uh, complexity, neither to your users or uh, to the developers immediately. Right? So then, uh, this problem I was discussing before about putting the gas fee uh, to prevent spam brings us to what could be done instead of uh, uh, instead of putting the gas fee. Well, the main point is that we need to scale Aurora. Uh, somehow, we need to allow uh, more transactions per second. Um, right now, Aurora is uh, living in a single uh, near shard. So as near grows and scale through sharding, Aurora won't immediately do it. So that's uh, the next steps we are pursuing uh, in our project, right? One, I would say it's uh, scaling through performance, like having a most performant uh, smart contracts, like more performant, let's not say interpreter. Right now we have an EVM interpreter, but we can move away from the interpreter and have uh, uh, better uh, engines to process uh, EVM transactions. If that exists, if, if, that, if we can make that, we will, we will be able to fit more transactions in a single uh, near shard. But ultimately, uh, the way to chart is uh, with uh, as uh, near pretends to chart, which is uh, probably the only healthy approach to charting, which is uh, 
approach to scalability, which is uh, charting. This has a lot of uh, complexity in it, because one of the points of Aurora, as I was mentioning before, was bringing to you all the synchronous environment. This will expose users to an asynchronous environment. So this is a discussion that we are still, uh, like we are still in the design. And we have uh, uh, Aurora Forum. Uh, I think you can get to it like forum.aurora.dev. And we're having all these discussions there in public. And we would love to have your input uh, if you have uh, any idea about uh, how to do this. We have some ideas, but uh, some of them are, uh, has uh, pros, pros, uh, pros and cons. And of course, uh, rollups is uh, nonetheless uh, another idea. Probably uh, us as Aurora won't be uh, developing rollups as, uh, as a company, but as Aurora exposes the same interface as uh, Ethereum does, mm, uh, like it doesn't prevent like some other company uh, that would love to uh, improve Aurora would uh, build uh, rollups on top of Aurora just to maybe to scale their own uh, applications, <coughs> right? So a little bit uh, moving now from uh, Aurora Engine and talking uh, a little bit about the Rainbow Bridge. This, uh, this is the tool that we have today uh, to move assets, like to actually uh, make uh, arbitrary uh, uh, chain communication between NIR and Ethereum. In particular, right now, one of the main uh, applications on top of the Rainbow Bridge is uh, transfer assets between one chain and the other. And in particular, this is what enables having uh, ETH as the base token in uh, Aurora ecosystem, is that we can actually bring ETH from uh, Ethereum uh, to near, and once it's in near, it's already uh, available to uh, to Aurora as well. So, how does this work? Let me try to briefly introduce you to the Rainbow Bridge. I think it's a fascinating piece of uh, technology, uh, and the main reason why I think it's uh, fascinating is because you need to trust somehow that when you're bridging assets or when you're uh, executing arbitrary. Uh, uh, executing arbitrary functions between blockchains, you need nonetheless to trust Ethereum validators and near validators. Like if you, if some of this uh, uh, trust is broken, everything will be broken. But you would don't want to trust anyone else, like any uh, intermediate, any third uh, parties uh, to make these transactions. And the Rainbow Bridge actually uh, achieves. Uh, this goal, but having a trustless bridge between uh, both chains. I want to emphasize that whatever you have on near, you have it uh, available immediately on Aurora, and you don't need any bridge between near and Aurora because they basically live in the same ecosystem. You need a bridge between near and Ethereum because they are like two parallel uh, ecosystems. They don't have any direct way to communicate, but near and Aurora, they do. Aurora is just a smart contract. Um, on top of uh, near protocol. How this works uh, is the following way. We have implemented uh, like clients on both, uh, on both sides. Like there is a near like client on Ethereum implemented also as a smart contract. And there is an Ethereum smart uh, like client implemented on, uh, on near uh, as a smart contract. Right? This uh, allows to make proofs about any event that happened on each of those uh, uh, on, each, on each of those uh, blockchains without requiring, like we can validate every block, we can validate the content of every, uh, of every block on both chains. These are smart contracts. We do have some off-chain tools, which we call relayers. We need relayers to move information from one blockchain to the other, but relayers cannot misbehave. Like they cannot do something uh, malicious, they cannot attack uh, the bridge because all the information they move from one chain to the other, it's uh, automatically uh, validated. There is a caveat here uh, of how it works from near to Ethereum that we need a watchdog, but I will not go into that. Maybe if you are interested, we can uh, discuss, uh, discuss uh, after the talk. So basically, once you can validate uh, the state of, any, uh, of every, anything that happened on each of those blockchains, you can have uh, connectors which will allow you to send information from one chain to the other. And in this case, information is enough 
for, uh, for sending assets from, from one chain to the other. For example, we do have this uh, ETH connector where basically you put, let's say you want to send two ETH from Ethereum to near, you put two ETH in this uh, locker, in this vault, and when you do this, uh, your ETH is uh, locked in the vault and an event is emitted. This event, you can prove it that happened on near ecosystem, so we are going to mint uh, two ETH for you on near ecosystem. All these uh, smart contracts are already are open source, are public, have been already audited, so there is no third party entity who can uh, affect them, so they, they are in some sense uh, trustless uh, smart contracts and trustless connectors. So whatever ETH you lock here, you can mint the exact same amount of ETH. There is no fee charge in this process, other than, of course, like the, uh, the blockchain fee, like paying for the gas on itself, but that cannot be avoided. But there is no extra fee on this uh, connector. Uh, when you have your, your ETH here, you can play here, like you can play on any DEX or whatever you want to do. And ultimately, uh, if you want to send it back, you basically burn the ETH. And with that event that it's emitted, you can unlock the ETH on the uh, other side of the bridge. Having uh, this type of connector is what allows us to have ETH as the base token on Aurora. We can move it uh, from Ethereum to NIR. And there is uh, on NIR a similar standard. I don't know if you're familiar with RC20 standards, but probably you are. It's like DAI, USDT, all this implements the R uh, RC20 standard. There is a similar standard on NIR called NEP141. And one interesting point is that the Aurora smart contract is actually the contract that implements the NEP141 standard for ETH. This means that all the ETH on NIR ecosystem lives inside the Aurora smart contract. So when you move ETH from Ethereum to NIR, this ETH is automatically available to you both for your NIR account and for your Aurora account because the ETH is uh, in the Aurora smart contract, right? Uh, so you can uh, use it uh, in, uh, both, uh, in both ecosystems uh, at once, okay? So, well, this is uh, pretty much everything I wanted to discuss today. I would be more than happy to ask uh, any question uh, you may have about Aurora. It could be both technical or uh, high level, uh, that's it. Yeah, so you, the last sentence you said, like, you can use ETH both on Aurora and NIR. Yes. But still, it's two different wallets, right? You have one wallet which is on uh, kind of MetaMask, let's say, Aurora wallet, which is spelled similarly to ERC, like, to Ethereum wallet. And then you have a near wallet where you can also have right. Fair enough. Yeah, that's fair. So there is one thing here. Uh, every for every near account, there is an implicit Aurora account. For this implicit Aurora account, you don't need a private key. Basically, whoever handles this uh, near account ID will handle this special uh, Aurora uh, Aurora address. So in theory, I, what I'd say probably was an oversimplification. <laughs> Uh, in theory, you can, like, there could be applications that are built uh, with this uh, design. So, with your NIR account, you can use, uh, you can sign transactions inside Aurora. It's not immediately trivial to do so. Probably the best way right now is uh, to use the Rainbow Bridge to move uh, the tokens between your NIR account and your Ethereum account for that, that you have your actual secret key, like your private key in your wallet. Uh, but in theory, you could like, there are the tools, there is the tools to uh, use the ETH inside of Aurora using your near account ID. There is a team which is actually building this uh, tool, which is basically using MetaMask on near, uh, uh, and having this tool will allow us uh, to use this feature. But yeah, I would say this feature, it's a little bit far from the end user. It's mostly for developers, let's say at this point. Uh, they could build a nice interface on top of it. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, the relay on NIA is uh, relay the transaction on the Aurora smart contract. Is that a permission or can anybody run a relay? <laughs> Anyone can run the relay. There is no, uh, there is no uh, permission. Like basically this relay is just calling the submit function and the relay itself is paying for the gas. 
and the code it's uh, made in such a way that uh, whatever gas price the sender of the transaction not the relayer but the the transaction that it's been relayed uh, the sender the that transaction contains the gas price so the relayer will get uh, this amount of uh, of ETH so the relayer knows in advance before sending the transaction how much uh, ETH they will get uh, uh, for the execution of the uh, of the transaction itself right but yeah it's uh, permissionless and there is actually uh, the code it's available so you can run the relayer yourself uh, it's a public in Aurora's new organization I think it's a partner deployed relayer something like this but we can find it later Mm -hmm. And would you expect in the future when eventually maybe near gas price goes up to have some kind of competition? Because uh, in Aurora uh, in the world, like every node can, can have in principle different eat gas price. So there are two questions. Let me try to address them both. Uh, for the first one, if there is uh, more than one relay running, yes, there is uh, more than one. Uh, we know this because in our relay, we're struggling a lot with uh, spam, so we have uh, pretty rough conditions, and we are iterating on this, uh, uh, on preventing spam as much as possible. And because of this, there are some partners that they basically say, "Okay, I will run my own relayer to prevent uh, going through all the, uh, like all the proxies that we have, like uh, ban rules that we have. They run their own relayers for the for their users." So basically, there are applications that instead of pointing to our relayer, they point to a custom uh, relayer. So yeah, and anyone can do it. Uh, uh, so for the second uh, question, uh, which is what happens with when near gas price uh, increases, and so here's the thing: near gas price works very similar to uh, Ethereum gas price after EIP 1559. So you cannot actually, like, it's not up to the node to decide uh, what is the near gas price. You cannot uh, play, uh, you cannot say I want to charge less, but... No, excuse me, but, but uh, my question was, no node can decide how much heat they can charge. And, and to, to, to like, remind me on that point, because the near gas price is higher. So, so basically, each layer can have the rules they want. Yeah. Uh, in the sense, they can put a zero gas price and completely cover for uh, for the, the gas for the users. And this is actually one of our goals with Aurora Plus. The idea is like the user could pay the gas, let's say, with a debit card, right? They come here in a freemium model where they just pay, I don't know, twenty dollars a month. I'm um, just saying some numbers. I didn't have uh, any number yet. This is on the way to be implemented and we are going to pay for all the gas price for this user there could be competing partners uh, doing this like as as part of the first question anyone can run the the relayers and the and there is no restriction uh, in this regard yeah, because it's quite interesting because like uh, gas price is not global in of course on of course yeah 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 yeah, yeah. anyway uh, any any uh, relayer will be uh, if, if they are running at a loss, it's because like they will not be executed at a loss, right? So they need to somehow recover the uh, the gas price. In general, I would say that since near at this point is extremely cheap, uh, most uh, uh, applications that want to run their own relayers, they they are kind of okay of running the relayer at a loss because maybe they will profit in, in another point uh, of the ecosystem. And well, one of uh, the north star of this project is that. We want the user to, uh, we want to remove the gas price from the users since, since this is one of the stuff with more friction for new users. Like you need ETH to start using uh, Ethereum, Aurora, but you actually don't want to start to start spending money uh, since you don't know what you're going to get, right? Is there a way to automate uh, this side uh, when you earn Ethereum on Aurora and uh, to convert it to near? It's definitely possible. Like you will need uh, to use some sort of uh, a DEX available. Like inside of Aurora, you have like three Solaris at this point. On near, there is a refinance. You can automatize this project uh, for sure. Uh, 
probably you don't need to do it like in the same transaction. You can have some sort of a side bot that it's automatically getting the near that you need. Uh, yeah, this is uh, certainly possible. Yeah. 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 We don't uh, right now. Right now, uh, I'm not. I'm aware that there are applications that are running their own relayers. But for example, if I'm running a relayer, I might enforce that this relayer will only send transactions that are for this particular contract. So maybe it's not like that you you want to have a generic relayers, and among all generic relayers, you want to have the cheapest one. There is no such thing at this point, probably because there are no too many uh, generic relayers. I would say. The main one is the public layer executed by uh, uh, Aurora, uh, Aurora Labs. For example, I have, ex I have run my own relayer, but I don't want people to be using my own relayer because I'm paying transactions uh, for oneself, uh, right? So it's not created right now. Maybe in the future when there are competing relayers and they are profiting from that, uh, it will uh, make more sense to, to have them. It has uh, Aurora Smart Control right now is uh, controlled by a uh, multi-sig, so it has uh, an update mechanism. It's important to have an update mechanism for several reasons. Uh, there might be uh, bugs in the code, but most importantly in Aurora is that we strive to have 100% compatibility with Ethereum, and Ethereum is uh, already is also uh, evolving, right? Um, there is a blog post in the forum about governance and gradability of Aurora, which I I uh, highly recommend. It's both for uh, Aurora uh, engine and for uh, Rainbow Bridge. And the main goal is that we move all the governance part, all the gradability part at least, to a DAO. So the main idea is that the whole process will be transparent. Uh, it is as transparent as possible today, but due to the uh, developers of Aurora trying to be uh, as transparent with the community and involve the community. Um, but uh, we want it to be like enforced by the the protocol that we uh, use uh, for uh, upgrading, right? So the main idea is that it will move to allow. But in general, yes, the contract will somehow have some uh, governing entity, even make a multi-sig, a DAO, whatever that makes uh, more sense. But yeah, uh, it does have uh, right now an uh, um, uh, upgrading mechanism. Yeah. Uh, this might be related to the last question. Maybe I don't know how a ah. relayer works, uh, but when I send a transaction from Ethereum, I sign an Ethereum transaction, send it to, to the relayer, where does this Ethereum go? Because I mean, who, who can, what does, if I send one Ethereum, I want it to appear on the near network, where does the actual Ethereum that is on the Ethereum mainnet, where does it end up? So what here's. Is it like who, can, who has the private key? How? So you will own your private key. Like okay. the private key is uh, on the on the user. Here is one thing: there are tons of uh, EVM chains, and the th the thing we uh, it's done to avoid uh, the user for signing a transaction in one chain and not be executed in another chain is that. Uh, there is this chain ID. It's like basically an argument that makes it such that if you sign a transaction with a par particular chain ID, this transaction can only be executed on that chain. Aurora has its own chain ID. Ethereum mainnet, the chain ID is one. It's like the main chain ID. So I'm saying this because you cannot send one ETH directly, like signing a transaction from Ethereum to Aurora. You need to use the bridge. And uh, using the bridge usually involves at least two transactions one on Ethereum to, to lock it, and one on near Aurora to uh, unlock it. But without that part, when you interact with Aurora, you have your uh, secret key in your wallet, and you need to configure MetaMask to use like not Aurora, not Ethereum mainnet. Uh, you usually can switch between networks. There is like Robsten, Rinkeby, uh, whatever. You need to add uh, Aurora there. Like there are, uh, you can see how to add it. Uh, on our documentation. And once you add Aurora, any transaction that you sign will use uh, this chain ID. 
it will be signed with your, with your private key, but in the context of your wallet. We don't know uh, your secret key at, at any point, like no one does, uh, on, unless on, like only your wallet, no? So you sign the transaction, and that's the transaction that you send to us, to the Aurora PC, right? So the Aurora PC gets a transaction and a signature, and that's it. And with that signature, I may be able to recover who are you, like uh, who is the user signing this transaction, and making sure that the whole thing is uh, properly signed. So if you have one ETH on Aurora, our relayer cannot send a transaction on your behalf without knowing your secret key. And your secret key is only known uh, by you. We can only relay transactions. We can only convert this transaction in a near transaction. And that's pretty much uh, what we can do. Do I need to go back? If I want to go back from Aurora to Ethereum, do I need to go to the same relayer? Uh, as, as I say, the relayer is, uh, can be executed by anyone. But in general, you need to go through some relayer. Or you can it doesn't need to be the same. It, no, it doesn't need to be the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. The relayer is just an interface to Aurora Engine, but it's just one. Like there could be multiple, or even you can get really low level and interact directly with near RPC and the Aurora Engine. You don't even need to go through a relayer. This is not uh, easy in some sense because we're not optimizing for that user experience uh, at all. But it's possible. It's certainly possible, and uh, yeah. Aurora, we say that Aurora is uh, completely trustless and decentralized uh, in the sense that it runs in a trustless and decentralized environment. The source code is public and there is no trusted entity uh, other than what I already mentioned about the upgradability uh, process. But like, we try to be as open as possible and uh, every change that it's done, it's uh, documented uh, before uh, it's actually done. Not very different to how you would upgrade like near protocol or uh, Ethereum itself, right? So the Aurora token is only used for governance? Aurora token right now, uh, it's, uh, it's only used for governance and for bootstrapping the, uh, the ecosystem. There are several uh, plans for it, uh, which are basically like, uh, it's, it's already described uh, on the forum. There are several plans ahead of it. Uh, but yeah, there are no, uh, you'll need to, to read there uh, what's the uh, long-term plan uh, with the Aurora token. The main point is to make uh, use of the uh, Aurora, Plus, uh, Aurora Plus, but eventually it will be used as well for governance. For governance. Well, right now it supports uh, staking, it supports, uh, it gives uh, uh, some amount of free transactions per month per users. In the future it will allow, like the main point, uh, at least short term, that we want to enable is that the user will be able to pay for free transactions. It's uh, quite uh, weird, but the user will be able to pay it in any, uh, in any token or even in, uh, using a debit card, credit card, whatever, right? So that's one of the main points. Aurora Plus, it's used a layer built on top of Aurora. It's not another uh, chain or anything, it's used a layer. And in some sense, it's something that it's more from, uh, owned from Aurora Labs, not from Aurora ecosystem, right? So Aurora Labs, uh, it's the tool of Aurora Labs to help the ecosystem use uh, Aurora as a whole. Yeah. Any other question? It's the same, like, I mean, there are, like, it depends of at which level do you see, right? It's the same relayer for everyone. We are running actually multiple uh, relayers and doing, like, load balance and whatnot, but that's, like, internal details, right? This is hidden from the user. There is one uh, Aurora uh, relayer, and uh, you interact with it through, like, mainnet.aurora.dev, if I'm not mistaken, and, uh, yeah, you will uh, use the benefits of uh, Aurora Relayer. Uh, now with Aurora Plus, there is like an API key, but it's not very different for, for, for how Infura works, right? So in Infura, you have an API key, but it's only for identifying uh, the user, not, uh, not for anything else. Do you have plans to, to have for a single user to have uh, its own RPC or uh, for better performance or 
So the answer is we plan to scale it as much as it's needed. It probably doesn't make sense to scale it f per user basis, but mostly for application basis. Uh, yeah, it makes sense uh, to do that. Uh, but yeah, there is no like, it's more about analyzing what's happening now and how we can be uh, as helpful as possible uh, in the ecosystem. Right now we are hitting some bottlenecks, which basically is that Aurora lives in a single uh, near shard. And if the shard gets uh, its full, like there's nothing you can do uh, about it. Like there's no amount of money you can use to improve that, right? So you basically need to scale Aurora through uh, other mechanisms. So it's not about the relayers in itself. It's about what uh, Aurora chart can sustain. Right now, it's a pretty high load, I would say. But we are working for making it uh, higher. Some other question? OK, I think we can wrap it up here. Uh, I'll be uh, around. So if you have any other uh, uh, questions, yeah, just approach me, and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>